Hello. In this lecture, we'll look at post-impressionism and symbolism, two movements happening relatively simultaneously between the late 1880s and right around 1900 in Europe, uh, and mostly centered around Paris and Germany. Now, post-impressionism comes and is a movement that is loosely defined as artists who were inspired by or uh, influenced by the Impressionist movement. It's not a unified style, but one of the things that does mark this style in painting is a, an analytical approach to some of the precepts and concepts that Impressionism brought out. There's also stylistically some consistencies Whereas these painters try and explore um, some of the expressive qualities of painting itself, of the techniques of painting, and the different ways that you can actually um, use some of the different tools and techniques in painting to create styles that are very unique. We're going to look at briefly at four painters, Georges Seurat, Vincent van Gogh, Paul Gauguin, and Paul Cezanne. Now, each one of these in their own way is very different. They try and do different things, and they have different techniques. But they're lumped together through circumstance, through timing, through coincidence. Um, and I think what makes them all uniquely interesting is that they, what they try and do is to create a, a new style of art and painting that doesn't reflect... Uh, the goal of trying to fit in or conform to what the academy or society or the patron or the viewer or anyone says that their painting should be. Instead, they rely on their own uh, ideas about what painting should be and what art should be and the direction that their work should take. Now, simultaneously, the symbolists are disdaining realism um, and they feel empowered to do that because of the, the work and the, done by the Impressionists. Um, realism, prior to Impressionism, was the, the main um, movement of the day. And for the symbolists, their goal was to focus more on creativity, on fantasy, imagination, uh, and on subject matter that was atypical, things that you wouldn't normally see in painting. Um, that were a bit more, you know, kind of mysterious or exotic. Now, this is Georges Seurat. Seurat is known and very famous for a technique that he invented called pointillism. And anyone who's ever attempted a pointillist work will tell you that it uh, is very, very time-consuming, very labor-intensive, uh, and the process itself is uh, is one that is it's not always very enjoyable. So pointillism breaks down the image into a series of dots or pieces, and each piece is separate, but the eye, especially the farther removed from the image that one gets, the eye tends to blend the colors. So what Seurat sees is that the world can be broken into these pieces, that all color is really not flat and uniform in nature, and as such, in our paintings, it shouldn't be flat and uniform either. Now, Seurat chooses images of everyday life. He chooses images. He likes images of you know, people in groups, people in parks, people bathing, people swimming, people you know, enjoying uh, you know, sort of just that normal everyday life of, uh, of leisure, basically. And you know, he, he really becomes famous for these sort of park scenes. His most famous work is... Sunday afternoon on the island of La Grand Jarte. This is a, a French park, and still today it's a place where people gather and just enjoy the, the, the sun and enjoy life. Um, now, what Seurat's goal was is to try and show that subject matter really wasn't important. What was important was an understanding of color. He really is a colorist. And so even in what looks to be you know, areas of flat 
black or flat color. It's not. Those are all, when you get up close, they're all really broken into thousands and thousands of these tiny, tiny little dots of color placed one next to the other, some of them gen you know, partially overlapping. And when you get up close, you see all that color broken, but it's when you get further and further removed from the, the painting, further away from it, that the eye blends it together. Now, Seurat might be influential in his understanding of color and how it breaks apart, but he wasn't influential in technique. You don't really see much uh, pointillism happening just after or even today. Van Gogh is another very famous post-impressionist, and like others, he's hard to categorize. He doesn't really fit into any one single category in terms of his style or technique. His brushwork tends to be very fluid uh, and very staccato, very short, choppy brush strokes that, that he doesn't bother to blend or overlap. Uh, his colors are very bright and garish. He doesn't mute the colors the way other artists might. He uses a lot of uh, primary colors, a lot of very intense colors. And his scenes, um, he takes a lot of liberties in terms of the the realism and the stylization of the scenes. Uh, what, you know, these figures become these kind of fluid language shapes, very suggestive, very simplistic. He gives the viewer very little in terms of realistic detail. And yet there's something about the scenes that really marks them as, uh, as interesting. His style is is uh, very attractive. Now, during his life and during his career, it, it wasn't his, uh, he's very famously uh, was turned down at every turn, uh, every gallery, every salon, every, um, you know, for display or sale of his works. He liked to choose as subject matter the most common things he could find, everyday scenes, everyday objects, because in those, he wanted to show that it's the role of the artist to find the beauty, to see the beauty, the beauty in the deterioration of sunflowers, the beauty in the textures of things, the beauty in the color and value of things. And, you know, to, for him and other post-impressionism, the art was in the stylization. The art was in the process that the artist uh goes through to create the work. And each artist has their own process. And artists shouldn't feel the need or necessity to uh, change or alter a process to fit somebody else's view of what art should be. Each of these artists is um, determined to create a style and a technique that is solely their own. This is Van Gogh's most famous work. It's called Starry Night. And, you know, this is not how he you know, realistic to the, the world and but it's how he chooses to see it and that choice is what's most important so the, the the night sky becomes a swirl of color and line and it has a very kind of naive quality to his works now some would argue that uh Van Gogh's style is influenced by his struggles and battles with mental health, mental illness. Um, he, we don't know for sure, he did, was diagnosed with some mental problems during his life, but from his letters, others have inferred that he probably battled with schizophrenia, certainly bipolar disorder, manic depression. Um, and he, you know, he received various treatments throughout his life to very little success. But I, I think, think that it's undervaluing his um, his brilliance to say that he's simply creating works based upon that or influenced by that. I think that what Van Gogh, what made Van Gogh so special was his absolute fearlessness when it comes to painting in a way that is is very direct and painting in a way that is has kind of a sim takes a simplistic sort of approach to uh, to the process of painting, to make it more like a child like might do it or see it. And ultimately, um, he's not interested or worried about how we feel about it. He just wants to, this is his expression. Now, he also uh, left us a series of self-portraits. 
And in those, we see how he, regardless of what the subject matter was, he sort of approached everything the same way. The, the object, the image, gets broken into these pieces. It gets broken into brush strokes of various colors, and the colors change, and the colors uh, kind of not necessarily connect specifically to the realism of the, what he sees in the world, but what he wants to see in the painting. We also see uh, over the course of these, his rises and falls, his ebbs and flows, and how he's feeling both about himself and his career and his life. Uh, Van Gogh was, was very troubled. And during his life, he um, kind of would latch on to individuals and people who he felt like were uh, important to his, his success and his happiness. Um, whether it was a, you know, a woman who he tried to woo and, and marry, who spurned his affections, or friends and other artists like Gauguin, who, try, who tried at various points in his life to support him and help him. Um, Van Gogh would always sort of go back and forth between this sort of intense you know, friendship and love or an intense distaste um, to the point where it finally cost him his life. But when we see these images, we see uh, an artist who has a, who's focused on uh, a, a very individualistic approach. Here, very famously, he is a self-portrait after uh, he's cut his own ear off. That's what he's, I suppose, most famous for, although it's one of the least important details of his life, other than what it tells us about how he, he uh, you know, how passionate he was, where he would get over things. You know, he cuts his ear off in the fit of of uh, spurned love and remorse. Ultimately, Van Gogh uh, succumbed to his, his mental health and uh, took his own life uh, at a very young age. But he was a very prolific artist, so we have many of his works still remain. Um, and, you know, he was so interested in his own work and in his own style and in following his own path, um, you know, that he was almost entirely self-taught. Gauguin was a friend of Van Gogh's, and we see a little bit of a connection in the use of color and the way that they sort of look at the, look at the world. But Gauguin is more of a fantastic realist, a fantastic abstract artist. He wants to create images that sort of evoke a, a fantasy or dreamlike state and the way that he uses color. He, he spent a lot of time traveling the world. He was from a family of bankers, and so as such, he could afford to do that. And, and uh, he was particularly enamored with, um, with the islands of the South Pacific, specifically Tahiti, and eventually gave up his life in Europe and moved there to Tahiti later in his life and spent at his days there. Um, we see a lot of that, that kind of view of the dream world versus the real, reality world in his works, um, that he, was, he came into contact with Tahitian myths and legends. Images like this one of the spirit of the dead watching, and these, you know, typical figures um, that look in sort of vaguely kind of inspired by realism, but the color, the modeling, the textures, all those things are uh, uniquely styled by uh, through his own work and through his own sense of aesthetics. Gauguin is very much a colorist. Um, he's he, he loves to explore and experiment with color. And we see that um, through the figures, through the, the specific techniques that he uses. Gauguin is, is also slightly metaphysical and spiritual. He likes to explore those themes and myths and, and uh, practices as belief systems throughout his work as well. The last of the post-impressionists, and perhaps the most important and influential on others, is Paul Cezanne. Cezanne is seen as the father of modernism in painting. Uh, more modernist painters will look to Cezanne for their style and influence and approach than any other of the post-impressionists. Cezanne, is, his works tend to be rather simple, um, simple subjects, whether they be landscapes or you know, cityscapes or still life. And what he does is he tries to look at whatever the object is, not as an object, not as a narrative, not as a story, not in terms of its connotation, but specifically as shapes, as colors, as values. 
and how to break and simplify those objects and values into the, the simplest terms to create a believable but not completely realistic image. So, you know, a basket of apples becomes basically just a series of shapes of color and values and a few shadows and highlights thrown in, but he doesn't perfect and blend all of that color. He allows it to be sort of rough and raw. And, and that's what's really most important about his work. He wants to deconstruct the image basically into color, into shape, into line, into pieces. And in that way, that's how he's going to be most influential because modernism is very much a deconstructionist movement to break things down to be able to understand it. Now, that doesn't mean that he's not working, um, in some, es some essence, realistically. It's still natural. We still see the subject matter. We still understand it. Um, the color, in particular, tends to be rather realistic. But what he doesn't do is he, or what he leaves out, are those elements of realism, those details that would make the image much more like uh, what he actually saw in nature. He doesn't feel like that that's necessary. What's more necessary and interesting is to kind of see how the play of value, the play of color, will create different, uh, different planar effects. Now, symbolism is a dramatically different movement. It is somewhat more unified than post-impressionism. Um, it definitely has a lot of has some similarities in the way that they see you know, use fantasy to use kind of dreamlike imagery. Um, the leading symbolists were not um, as unified in their approach um, that in terms of how their their style looks. It's really more of how they leave subject matter. Now, these works tend to be um, less influential moving forward. Modernism is going to kind of abandon symbolism as and see, for for the for early part of it, especially in Paris. Um, but we will see the symbolists kind of come back and make a resurgence as, of influence as we move into later uh, more abstract and more uh, expressionistic movements, especially in Germany and the United States. So in a, in, in a certain sense, a lot of the symbolists continue to have um, play with some of the, the great themes that art has always played with of heroes and kind of mythical creatures, um, but what we tend to see in these works is a, um, a more graphic approach. Um, part of that has to do with the changes that we're seeing happening uh, in society. Art in general, is, there's a, a movement in art towards a more illustrative approach. Now, the other important aspect of symbolism is that when we think about a symbol and what it represents, symbols are kind of tied to their culture. And so the symbolists wanted to create a work, a style that was representative of its culture, but not necessarily universal. They didn't feel like they, the need to, to tie their work to all of the history of art or culture. They, they felt like it could be more, um, more specific to themselves. And, you know, sometimes a symbol is only a symbol. Uh, it's only an effective symbol if we all buy into it, if we all understand it. And so the nature of symbolism is that if you don't understand it, it's not necessarily the fault of the artist. Um, it, it's, it's not, you know, it might diminish its effect, but it doesn't, doesn't really change with the kind of symbol it is. These artists also very often were, were either loosely taught or self-taught, and they didn't feel the need to kind of buy into the traditions of art, uh, of the, the realism, of learning realism first and moving on from there. We see a lot of more exotic um, creatures, more exotic locations, you know, desert scenes, jungle scenes. Um, and these works are uh, were reasonably well 
uh, received during their day. But it's a very short-lived movement. It's not a movement that's going to carry forward. Perhaps the most uh, important symbolist was uh, Edvard Munch. Munch, uh, in his most famous work here, The Scream, created a, uh, a work that was based more psychologically, and that's where the symbolism comes in, uh, of feeling. You know, he, he's not trying to capture the realistic view of it of the figure or what they look like or how they act or move, but just the feeling uh, that, that of, of the emotion that's expressed. And that's ultimately what the goal here is. And I think that um, the other element about this movement artistically is how it connects to what's happening in literature and music. This is at a point where we're starting to see fantasy become more prevalent, uh, the romantic uh, literature movement of the late 19th century um, is very influential on the symbolists. And we see these, there is an element of narrative in the symbolists, but it's not a kind of a, a straightforward standard narrative. It tends to be more ambiguous and mysterious, and that's on purpose. Now, one of the more interesting symbols is a man by the name of Klimt, Gustav Klimt. Klimt is Austrian, and he's a very important um, and influential Austrian artist. His works are s sort of strangely ethereal and, and um, heavily patterned and textured and stylized. But ultimately, they're, they're beautiful figurative works, and I think that that's what's most important. Um, is that he starts with the figure. He starts in nature and he starts with the beauty of the figure. And he moves towards um, kind of creating, instead of a standard background or setting for his figures, these more patterned, kind of um, abstracted, um, almost non-objective uh, surfaces. And this is one of his more famous works. It's called The Kiss. And... We read it and see it and understand it in the way we do a kind of a typical narrative painting, but it's it's anything but that. It, it really is. He's he has abstracted it um, very heavily, and I think that that's that's important. He's going to be very influential personally on a ne the next generation of artists and their uh, desire and focus on abstraction. In terms of photography. Um, Gertrude Casebeer is sort of a crossover between impressionist and a symbolist photography. She uses a lot of the techniques, the sort of hazy atmospheric value and light and tonal ranges of the impressionists, but she chooses as her subject matter some more kind of traditional things that are more symbolic. Uh, here, a Madonna and child scene, um, you know, but filtered through her own style. And then she also was experimenting with photographic techniques of overlaying multiple negatives to create so the, the first kind of composite images, you know, using the techniques that we're much more familiar with today of blending and blurring um, frames together or negatives together to create and exposures together to create uh, sort of some odd juxtapositions. Now, as we move into the next section, what we'll find in Unit 4 in, in, with a more specific look at 20th century and early 21st century art is that um, a lot of what was happening in the 19th century really kind of set the stage. And Without it, we really wouldn't have uh, what we have uh, happen in the 20th century with the explosion of art under modernism. But we'll look at that in future lectures.